Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 35th episode of the Exploring Antinatalism podcast, a podcast all about the subject of antinatalism created by antinatalists. My name is Amanda Oldfan Sukunik, also known as Forever Wolf Films on YouTube. And I'm Mark J. Maharaj, also known as Question Mark on YouTube. And today, we're speaking with antinatalist YouTuber, animal rights activist, and fellow founder of Antinatalism International, Tejas. Welcome to the Exploring Antinatalism podcast, Tejas. Hello, hello, hello. Thank you for inviting me here, Mark Amanda. Absolutely. Thank you for being our guest today. Um, so I want to start out with just a couple of basic uh, questions about you, Tejas. Um, in your words, who is Tejas? Um, who is Tejas? Well, I, um, I live a double life. Like um, I live a um, run-of-the-mill corporate job, do that. Nobody at my job knows the other part of it. Um, so the other life is I am an animal rights activist, as you said, I've been vegan, I am antinatalist, used to be child free, um, all those things. So that's pretty much it. Okay. Uh, so Tejas, you're probably the fellow founder of ANI that I've known the longest um, because of your YouTube channel, which we'll speak about in, in a lot more detail in just a little bit. Um, but to be honest, I, I mean, I really know so little about you. Can you tell me a little bit about like what your early life was like, um, you know, where you grew up and things like that? So yeah, so I grew, I was born and brought up in India. Um, like if you are pretty much in a middle class, sort of semi-privileged background, so I, in, in such a case, you do your education, which is mainly vocational education usually, and then you're supposed to marry and have children and live your life. So I, I did that part till I got my education and a job. Um, and then I uh, turned vegan after that. I think it was in 2003. Um, and then I came across, so I, I, became vegan and then came across a lot of literature on the subject, um, like uh, writings of, for example, Peter Singer and so on. Um, so until 2006, 2008, I was still wondering about what things are, what, you know, what does it mean? What, why do people have children, blah, blah, blah. And I even met a few psychologists, psychiatrists, where they are, to, assess whether what I'm asking is coming from a mental disorder or is it just I'm trying to find out. And there wasn't any answer to my questions, mainly about why people have children, um, amongst others, like, you know, what's the meaning of this, blah, blah, blah. So I, at that time, decided that until I find an answer, I would rather keep it as a personal choice and decided that I would never have children. And then actually came David Panetta. So his first, I think the first time I read him was in that Life, Death and Meaning, chapter 10, where he gave a teaser of his, you know, asymmetry thought. And then there was better never to have been. I, and that's, that was the moment when I thought that, oh, hang on, this is not about just a personal choice. This is something bigger than that. And then you start exploring the subject, the way I, went through about veganism and animal rights and speciesism and so on. <clears throat> and 10 years down the line, here I am. So was it, you said life, death and meaning, or was it the better never to have been? <clears throat> the first time I read about uh, what the asymmetry was and David Benatar was in life, death and meaning. So life, death and meaning was, I think, a book compiled by David Benatar, yeah. which had chapters from various different authors. And he wrote one of them. And in that, he explained the sort of asymmetry in terms of harms and benefits at the time, I think. Yeah. How did you... And then... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Late, and then later, he, um, I think, elaborated that in Better Never To Have Been. How did you come across that book? I guess if you if you start Googling about, you know, like, what's what's going on? What is this? What is life? What is meaning? You would most probably stumble across that book. Okay. Gotcha. Um, when it came to the animal rights stuff, you, you mentioned Peter Singer. Was there any other thinkers or books that you, uh, you consumed during that time? Uh, not that time, but later I have uh, gone through Tom Regan. And uh, there's also this um, Irish slash English author called Roger Yates, 
uh, who have whose work I have been following. Uh, these two and um, there are others who are not in animal rights but who have influenced my thought towards that. So in India, for example, there is a politician called uh, Maneka Gandhi, who who was actually my motivation to be vegan, but she's more of a welfareist. And she has used to run the show called Heads and Tails in 1995, um, back you know in the day. And that had a big influence on me at the time, but it was not until 2003 when I gave a serious thought to it. Uh, Tejas, why are you an antinatalist? Why am I an antinatalist? Um, well, suffering is bad pretty much but um so I, I don't know it's the same reasons mainly what david benetta has put on his asymmetry the risk argument to an extent consent argument i mean i know there are uh, two sides to it but the risk and asymmetry uh, pretty much david benetta made me an activist you can say the risk uh, asymmetry and probably quality of life argument sorry the quality of life argument too um yeah but it has a subjective element in it but uh, to an extent yeah okay so the the main arguments for you is the axiological asymmetry and the risk argument yes and um okay um what's your overall opinion about the consent argument i do agree with the consent agreement in the sense that no one has consented to be born. Um, and I also agree with Shauna Schifrin's case that we should assume consent in some cases where we want to reduce the suffering, uh, where we want to gift somebody with some pleasure. That is should not be or would not be the reason to assume a consent. And I think that is only in my case, like, why should we follow that rule? Like, why is it because the Shana Shiffrin says that the only case is that we follow this rule for other scenarios in the life. So we're just being consistent. That's yeah. the only, um, I think, basis why we should follow that rule. And that's where the consent argument comes from. So to that extent, I agree with it. Tejas, when was the first time you think you heard the word antinatalism? I frankly don't remember. And it must be, again, it must be either better never to have been or that uh, the chapter be before that. Uh, but I don't really remember when I, I heard, I don't even remember when exactly I became an antinatalist. I, and that's like, I never had an epiphany of, oh, hang on, now I'm, I'm an antinatalist. Um, this is the same case for when I became an atheist. I don't remember when I actually became an atheist. Uh, there was a sort of a period um, as opposed to when I became vegan. But yeah, I, I don't remember when the antinatalist in me was born. That's really interesting. I mean, I, I think for so many of us, there's like some sort of eureka moment or like an aha kind of moment with so many of these subjects. I know I definitely had that with antinatalism. Um, I, rem I remember it dawning on me pretty early on with, with atheism. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm always interested in how people kind of I mean, I, I remember the thing. period. Yeah. I, I remember the period, like it was definitely during that better never to have been time, 2006, 2008, 2010, somewhere yeah. like that. But I don't remember the exact move, move like moment where um, it's like when you say the fetus became sentient, it was like that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Um, I mean, I think that's so interesting that you... Um, you really have seen the full course of the development of this thing. Like if you were coming to this sometime in 2006, like that's when Better Never To Have Been came out. So you sort of saw a pre-antinatalism period of time and then literally, you know, as the way the things have developed, you know, from, from there to now. So that must have been a very fascinating thing to sort of watch grow. I mean, did you, I know we didn't, I know I didn't add a question about this in the, in the questions themselves, but, um, when was it that you first started to like research antinatalism or uh, maybe you didn't know the word yet, but started to investigate it online, you know, as opposed to uh, the books that you had found? So I think it was after Better Never to Have Been, but, you know, um, I have to say that uh, Inmendum 
has had a big influence on me he was probably the first person on like who was who i was seeing talking who was yeah. clearly talking about or against procreation until that time it was just child free people you know yeah oh i don't like children or what not i want money blah 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 but i think he was in my memory that might have been more uh, was the first person i could see who was clearly talking as it was and at that point somewhere i start must have been um you know googling the world yeah um so he definitely his videos have helped so what what year round do you think you first noticed in mendham then mm, let me try and remember that because it was definitely not before i was in ireland and i came to ireland in 2008 i think it was quite later like 2012 2010 plus 2012 definitely okay yeah yeah um, that sounds yeah. about right not after 2012 yeah okay yeah because by 2012 the he would have known the word antinatalism and so that would have made sense that you you know if you were searching you would have found him by then because before that he was talking about it but that word wasn't attached so okay very interesting um you are as far as i know the inventor of the term for antinatalism in both marathi and hindi if i'm not mistaken i'm probably am i if I, am i saying marathi incorrectly marathi yeah no, you're right okay 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 good um so how can i ask a little bit about how you came to uh, originate um this version of the term antinatalism and i was wondering if you could say it for me so it is pronounced as uh, prajanan virodhi um i don't I, i don't want to take credit as inventor because all i did was i joined two words together and it, this is done in these languages all the time so for example um if you are opposed to something you say that thing virodhi virodh means to oppose virodhi is an opposer and vad is um a th- uh, um a thi- um an ism and vadi is following of follower of that ism for example prajanan vadi would be a pro natalist and prajanan virodhi could be an anti natalist um so prajanan is pro creation and i don't know if it's a fall, false cognate or it has a, they have same root in indo european uh, language but prajanan like they all they both start with pro prajanan and pro creation are the same things so prajanan virodhi like pro creation opposer that's what it means so i just constructed it those words existed in themselves i just joined them okay fascinating fascinating um are there indian words for antenatal list vehement child free uh and an ethelist um for antenatal list definitely as i said prajanan virodhi prajanan virodh is opposition virodhi is opposer so prajanan virodhi vehement is a is an uh, abbreviation right so i doubt if there be a word for it okay. voluntary human extinction movement i'll have to construct word by word translation of all the long form of it so i doubt there's a word there is definitely a word for child free um it's called apatya mukta so apatya means child and offspring um and mukta is free so apatya mukta like again the same trick joining the words here yeah um as opposed to by the way childless which i call it apatya rahit rahit is somebody who lacks so apatya mukta is child free and for ethelist again it's a little bit of play on the word so it isn't an english actual word so it's hard to translate yeah um, and that's okay i think i mean we have loads of words in in these languages in marathi and hindi which have come from other languages for example we have thousands of words coming from english for, for example police people use police as police um, it's cops in my kind of but police in england um there are loads of words from portuguese which have come in there are loads of words from middle eastern languages which have come in so there's no harm in using the word as it is and calling it a native word um, eventually it will become so i'm not opposed to that so i'm not like a translation nazi no <laughs> so whenever i can i can try to translate yeah okay interesting thank you so much do you consider yourself a benetarian antinatalist I 
I don't know because I feel that I haven't read enough of Benatar to call myself that. I mean, I've read a lot of his books. Um, for example, I haven't read his yet, read his thesis on the rights which he has written. Uh, there are there are always you know papers here and there. I keep on finding like still better never to have been or reply to critiques of this that. So I think I haven't read the full thing of it to call myself a Benetarian, but I would say he has had a big influence on me. Mm. When it comes to his his arguments and his points, what do you feel his? Um, you've mentioned two where he's he's strong the asymmetry and the risks, was there any other points or arguments that you think are strong? And where do you feel he is weakest in things that he said? Yeah, so hey, I liked his um, work on optimism bias. Um, although that's, that's a very, it's not about, that work is not about constructing a philosophy, but rather observing and seeing what actually it is. So it involves a lot of surveys maybe and psychiatrists and psychologists work but i liked that i i never knew that well, there was such a thing so it's i don't know how strong it is in terms of supporting antinatalism but that i definitely took on board once i went through it um in terms of what where he is weak uh in it, weak in terms of defending antinatalism or weak in terms of what work i think he should still do both. Um, I don't know about both. defending antinatalism where he is weak because uh, I don't think I am fully qualified to say that. But I can say that um, where his work is lacking for me is he has written human predicament. I am expecting for him to write a non-human predicament book also. Yeah. So um, he has uh, touched on those points in Better Never to Have Been about how the arguments sort of apply to non-humans also for antinatalism. But I want it, I want him to do it in a full-blown um, way. Like they do apply to non-humans, and in some cases they do apply even strongly to non-humans where we breed animals. So uh, I would want him to elaborate more on that. It deserves a book, I think. Yeah, the sentient predicament. It's yeah, I'd love to see that from him. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Aside from Benatar, who has been your biggest influences as an antinatalist? Yeah, so um, for antinatalism, as I said, Inbendum has been a big influence. Uh, people might argue about controversies and whether he's a philosopher or not, blah, blah, blah. But he definitely has been a big influence on me. Um, apart from that, I think not. So I have, Richard Dawkins has been a very big influence on me. And uh, I know he's not an antinatalist. I know he's written books where he celebrated his grandchildren. But the foundation of antinatalism is, I think, uh, he has contributed a lot in my mind because especially the evolution and the selfish gene and the removal of your religious affiliations, all of that came uh, from Richard Dawkins to me at the right time, I think, before I... Uh, could fully fall for antinatalism. So Richard Dawkins has been a big, very big influence. Also, I would say, and again, Peter Singer is not an antinatalist and he's a utilitarian, but he has made some very good points during, you know, when I go through his work. For example, he has questioned about if you are allowing abortion, um, abortion, like if the sent sentience is not achieved and if you are killing that fetus, I don't know if killing is a correct word, but if you're terminating that fetus before that, if you're saying that's okay because that fetus has not achieved sentience, if the fetus has achieved sentience to an extent that, that it can feel pain, what's wrong in euthanasia? He has questioned that. Like, um, in, he has <clears throat> done that in terms of, in the context of disability, that parents should have an option of disabled children to euthanize them. But he has at least questioned that. So there are places in his work which you know align with antinatalism, and I, I think he has an influence on in that. But mainly Richard Dawkins and Mendham, and then Penetra. Okay. Um, you mentioned Peter Singer and him being a utilitarian. Is there a, a normative theory of ethics that you lean towards, or 
um, or do you have any opinions on these different theories? I think that I am not, so I didn't study philosophy. Um, I was very much an engineering student um, and I've been an engineer for the whole of my life. But so to, to speak of a normative theory, I think I have, I'm not fully qualified to speak confidently on that. But I can, whatever I've been reading, I can say that uh, utilitarian, as in traditional utilitarian or positive utilitarian, I don't pretty much agree with it. Um, Peter Singer is one of them, I think. Um, ap apart from that, <clears throat> the virtue-based or duty-based theories, I haven't, like I haven't studied them, so I'm not a very good person to talk about. The negative utilitarian theory, although, <clears throat> has a certain appeal to me, although I wouldn't call myself full-fledged negative utilitarian. But I would definitely donate money for having a hospital than having a garden. That much I would say. Okay. Thank you. Um, as you know, Tejas, anti-procreation is sometimes broken up into four general schools of thought, anti-natalism, <clears throat> ethalism, vehement voluntary human extinction movement, and child-free. Can you share some of your thoughts about each of those with me? Mm -hmm. Sure. So these four schools of thoughts, um, where do I start? I think I'll start with permanent, uh, voluntary human extension movement. Um, voluntary human extension movement, as I understand it, is a speciesist movement. And when I say that, I think it con gives consideration only to humans, maybe in a misanthropic way, uh, but only to humans. And I don't think that if humans only are extinct, suffering is going to be reduced. Well, it would be reduced to a good extent, but not anywhere near enough. You know, there's, there's still going to be a lot of suffering. So it doesn't consider suffering of other species. It thinks that other species are all hunky-dory living in a paradise. And I don't think that's the reality. So I don't quite agree with the thought, although I would welcome, always welcome somebody who is not reproducing for whatever reasons. Um, child free i was a child free i technically i am a child free um but it's a personal choice i think so it's it's more of a what do you call descriptive thought than a prescriptive like you know i am child free okay i am I, i'm not talking about what should be um antinatalism needless to say i agree with all of it but in um, the difference between antinatalism and ephilism is what i want to um, talk about. I think that there is this difference between antinatalism and ephilism gives an unnecessary excuse for people to draw arbitrary lines um, between species. So there are people who think antinatalism is only against human procreation. And if you are against procreation of animals, then you are an ephilist. So that's not true. There is nothing in the word antinatalism which talks about any species. It is just anti and natalism. So by creating these two terms, and this is a semantic argument really, I do. there's nothing to disagree in ephilism. Um, by creating these two terms, we just give a leeway for people to differentiate on those lines which don't make any sense. In my view, antinatalism itself can be classified if you have to in terms of local antinatalism where you think that it is not um, procreation is not moral in certain pocket of space or time like maybe in now for the world's population or in india because it's too populated or for a certain species because there is just too many of them and uh, they're suffering blah 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 that can be a local variant of antinatalism and there can be a global antinatalism where we say that procreation is uh, wrong or at least causes suffering across the board. Uh, that's what I think. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Tejas. I'm glad you brought up, uh, well, first of all, the uh, the local and global antinatalism, uh, those two distinctions. I, I feel like there was a period of time where people were really talking about that a lot and they were sort of being argued a lot. And I don't hear about it nearly at all anymore, which I think is so interesting. It's definitely something I think needs to be talked about more. And you and I have talked a lot in the past about sort of like this differentiation between antinatalism and ephilism and the need for 
you know, both words. And, and, I, and I know you know that the reason why this word was created in the first place is because people were making that distinction and people were sort of uh, gatekeeping antinatalism as only being a term for uh, for the humans and not the animals. And so this was sort of a way to put one's foot down, so to speak, and go, no, it's for all life. Um, so it, see, it, it almost sort of seems, from my perspective, like people are wanting to separate them no matter what you do, whether you have one word or two words. It's so controversial, you know, in some people's mind that they just try to tear the two apart no matter what sort of differentiation we make or not make. And it's very frustrating. I can, I definitely understand what you're saying from your perspective. Tejas, you explained uh, vehement, child-free, antinatalism. What were your, did you have more thoughts on ethalism? I, <clears throat> what, from what I understand about ethalism is it's just, it is a sort of a flavor of rejectionism. We're rejecting this whole game of um, sentient life. That's that's my understanding. And if that is the case, the root behind the root cause behind rejecting that is antinatalism. Like so, there's a very small difference between the two, if at all. I think we can uh, at at certain point. I've said that. There is a difference in direction. So ephilism is more of an extensionist thought that we want to bring about extension. And the best way to bring about an extension is to not procreate. And so that's the direction of ephilism. Whereas the for antinatalism is that procreation is wrong because we're creating a sentient being and then suffer, blah, blah, blah. Right. And the, if the consequence of that is extension, so be it. That directional differences I've made sometimes, I don't know if that is really the case, but that was my understanding. I think as, as I consider myself a Benetarian sentiocentric antinatalist, I'm going to probably add more names to that label. But uh, yeah, no, I, I, I think you clarified that really well. Um, so you agree with the ephilism ideas, but you don't call yourself an ephilist. I'm, kind of, I'm still kind of confused about that. Like, and you seem hesitant to answer that question. I don't want to... You know, like, I don't like people differentiating between human procreation and non-human procreation as yeah. far as antinatalism is concerned. I mean, there are differences. But whether it is, whether it causes suffering or not, at least to the minimum, there is no difference. Those arguments for antinatalism apply to non-humans yeah. so pretty like much equally. Sentiocentrism um, or sentiocentric uh, antinatalism. You have Benetarian and you have Ephilus sentiocentrism. What's the difference? None, as far as I know. Yeah. Okay. Why should there be? Yeah. There's what the individual sentiocentric antinatalist, what the individual Ephilist is going to find acceptable or not acceptable or what they're going to want to do or not going to want to do or what they're going to be willing to say or not going to be willing to say or I think there's directional the differences, but I, I don't I, see, I, I don't see why there is, I don't, they're, they're both coming from exactly the same uh, conclusions. Uh, I should have asked this question. When you say life, it's against life. Benatar asked you this on the podcast. Is it life, sentient life, or is it just life in general? Because there's non-sentient life. Well, there's, there, I, I would say, of course, it's sentient life that we're concerned with, but there's also no reason to protect and keep non-sentient life. And I think that the, the possible danger of like, like leaving a non-sentient life um, is what would, what would be the course of evolution, per, perhaps, of that life that you're leaving behind? Are you leaving any possibility, any window or door open for a later, I think this is how I answered it too, basically when we interviewed Benatar, that it's like, if there's any possibility at all that that life could somehow evolve and take a different form and gain consciousness and um, something of that sort, then yeah, yeah just get rid of it. Yeah, um, because the diagnosis is the replicating DNA and- right. It seems like that's the root of the problem. Right. Um, I was just going to say that, yeah, I mean, non, there is 
non sentient life the the only reason to be against non sentient life is the eventual evolution into sentience probably but then there is also an argument okay that you do this on earth what about other places in the universe and i think that um, that is not an argument against this position that is just a problem in this position that just because we can't do that we shouldn't do this is not a secret that is not doesn't follow yeah. from there but that that problem is there we can't ignore that problem so i know you don't want to use well i don't even know if you're because you said you don't want to you didn't you didn't say this but you're like i believe in the ideas of aphilism yeah i mean yeah. there isn't anything to disagree with aphilism i'm so just saying are, that are you an extinctionist like do you want to create an extinction event well that's an ambiguous question right because uh, well, okay, if i say you, yes would you, I, the, would you press the red button let's put it that way just get right to it now <laughs> <laughs> sorry this is funny okay <laughs> you know i would answer the red button question in this way that <clears throat> i know i've seen um, heard interviews of benetar and he has been completely against pressing the red button given the uh, given the preconditions of red button that the entire life is annihil annihilated instantly without like really instantly this is a thought experiment not practically possible but if it is if that is the prerequisite if that is a precondition then what i would say is i have not found a logical counter argument to that um peretor has denied it saying many things like he said that death is bad uh, even for those who are dead because that have destroyed them but why is that a bad thing and i have not found so far a logical answer to that so i would say that for the thought experiment of red button where the entire life is um, nullified instantly without any pain or sense of pain i have not found a counter argument to not press it. okay i have found arguments to press them but so far i have not come across a counter argument That's okay so okay there, there's the red button in terms of the hypothetical but then in practice so like the red button kind of gives you the motivation that okay you you want to bring about extinction and uh bring about an ethical extinction would you have like the moral impetus or would you have the moral duty to bring that into fruition like is there is there a moral duty to uh to end all sentient life okay let me let me put it this way amanda could you explain your end game plan and see if tejas agrees or not we will be causing a, a circumstance by our extinction that we're either going to leave the animals alone or not. And so that's what I call the effless vehement crossroads. As I said earlier, we have the, we can go down the F the vehement road where we do nothing. Basically we let them inherit the earth after us, which I don't think is the more ethical path personally. And then there's the vehement road. I mean, the, sorry, the, the effless road where we do something. And I, I think, hopefully honestly there's a myriad of, of ways of attacking that that circumstance that um for our own extinction let it take a hundred for full sentient extinction like let it take a hundred years however long it takes there's no doesn't need to necessarily be this instantaneous rush towards it sterilize what you can um but as far insofar as like our current technologies or current technologies that we have in the foreseeable future, as far as I know, and as far as what other people that know more than me have told me, we wouldn't necessarily have the ability to end the rest of sentience without killing some of them, which is awful and I hate it, but in the interest of their never being suffering again, it, you know, in the, it, that's in our control, by the way, I have never met an Ephelus that believes in aliens. I don't know if you guys have. So I, I always kind of take that element of it. It's very interesting, theoretically, um, you know, what, what that would entail we do if there is. Um, but as far as the suffering that we have access to and some control over, that that would be Basically that, you know, we don't have all the answers yet, all of us just sitting in our rooms, that this should basically be the greatest, biggest human. There is no, 
bigger civil right than for human beings to work towards as ethical a sentient extinction as possible, basically. Um, and, 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 and I think it also begs the question, is there any extin extinction scenario where it happens 100% ethically. I'm not sure that that exists. And I think that if it doesn't exist, humans really ought to contend with that as a truth or a non-truth. That is there really no way out of here with nothing getting hurt. And if that is the real circumstance of our lives on planet Earth, then we really do have a responsibility to try to make our eventual extinction, which is inevitable, better than worse. We can have a really bad extinction or we can have a better extinction. And I think that should be um, the, the ultimate responsibility of humankind. Sorry for going on and on. No, that was good. Um, can I say something on that? Yeah. So uh, there is this chapter six, I think, in Better Never To Have Been, where Benatar talks about human extinction. Okay. Um, now there are, human extinction in and of itself like how to bring about human extinction can be 1000 different ways one way better than other and we can debate infinitely about it but uh, he has proposed a way and the position there is that there is always going to be some suffering the last generation is going to suffer and is going to suffer seriously but even then we are saying that antinatalism should be there, we should not procreate. So we are accepting that there are, there are going to be humans who are going to suffer enormously. And we are accepting that as a fact. And even then we are saying we should still not procreate and let extinction happen. If we are saying that in case of humans, then it is logically consistent to say if, if there are no um, deeper differences in case of suffering of non-humans and humans, then it becomes logically consistent to say that we should be equally accepting of the fact that there would be some non-humans who are going to suffer as a result of this. Um, so this, I think what Amanda, you just said, is just an extension of the human extinction scenario. And there is, I, I don't find a reason strong enough to put a line just at human extinction. Like if you're accepting human ex suffering for human extinction, we should accept non-human suffering for non-human extinction also. Now, how to go about it and what are different ways, that is something, an enormous subject. Uh, we can disagree on that and I'm sure nobody knows the full answer to it. This, although I would, you know, on, on, on the side of caution, this is a sort of a utilitarian argument. Um, I don't remember who exactly it was with Sam Harris, who put forward the case that the nuclear bombs on Japan in 1945 was a correct step to take if we consider the fact that otherwise World War II would have gone for 100 years. So, you know, that was his position. I'm not saying it was whether I agree or disagree because it's a controversial subject. I don't know enough. But it's sort of you know, like that. So we need to consider this very carefully. Is, is what I'm saying. I agree. Um, so the method is undecided in ethelism. I don't know that every ethelist would say that, but I'm I, I, I would, I, I would say this that, you know, there should be a change in, in the direction of thought. But right now, we are not even thinking in these terms. We are thinking about how to go on Mars and have life there. Yeah. So right now, the direction itself is so wrong. First step is to stop that direction and think about this. And I'm sure if the whatever we've done so far, there would be a ways, different ways, better ways, which people can come up with. Yeah. How does your antinatalism intersect with other social and ethical issues, such as atheism, veganism, and the right to die? I know you've spoken a little bit about this already, but I'd love it if you could elaborate on that a little bit. Sure. So atheism, for myself, I cannot imagine. I was brought up in a very, very conservative Hindu background, very religious background. So and I was like, if you are a Hindu, you are 
taught that there is uh, what do you call uh, what's the word reincarnation there's a next life you get another life blah 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 <clears throat> different theories on that and then you worship god and all that so all for all those different reasons i cannot imagine if i was not an atheist and if i was if i was still a religious person how would i have uh, how i would have been an anti atheist i would have been in a very psychological complex about even being a child free and not doing my duties as i should be um so for me i can't imagine anything other than atheism as a road or as an as an essential as a prerequisite to anti atheism although i see a lot of people who are of some sort of religious backgrounds buddhist hindus christians muslims who are who are anti atheist also and there are ways to reconcile those things they have found it out good for them but yeah for me atheism is the foundation of all these things um i was vegan before i was anti atheist definitely um so yeah there's a big controversy here but i would say this there's a big overlap between the two subjects um to an extent that um to an extent that they can be at some point said as same thing although there are superficial differences um so for example if i am drinking milk of an animal and i'm calling myself anti natalist now that milk cannot be obtained without procreation of that animal it is as simple as that and it i'm i'm really surprised that people don't consider this or have given a thought to this most of the people i talk to or i used to talk to on streets about um, animal rights outreach never gave a thought to it they thought milk is a product which comes from cow or buffalo and that's it that the cow and buffalo has to be bred they have to be made pregnant in order to get milk was never in their thoughts it's not that they didn't know but you know nobody the thought of that so if you are if you are consuming a product which is a direct result of procreation then you are, there is an inconsistency at least in terms of if you're calling your yourself anti natalism is what i think so and same goes for you know meat meat products like chicken and beef and all that these animals have to be bred today at least as far as mammals are concerned i think it's more than like 60 64% by weight land by mammals are livestock which means they're bred by humans 36 are humans 36% and only 4% are wild animals procreating uh, naturally whatever you call it so you know there's a big inconsistency if you're not a vegan and calling yourself anti natalism i think um calling yourself anti natalism um from the other point of view if you are vegan and you are a procreating i think there is inconsistency there as well because if you're vegan uh, what you are really saying is that all these 64% wild uh, sorry 64% livestock mammals or 70% of the birds would not have come into existence if the world was vegan and you're saying you're okay with that which means you're saying that non existence is preferable than the suffering which you're going to bring about and if you're saying that then and if you're then procreating then there is an inconsistency from uh, that side also and for these two mainly reasons apart from the misanthropic things that you know if you procreate the child is there's a chance they'll eat meat blah 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 apart from that these two inconsistencies i think uh, indicate us to a big overlap between these two subjects um i know benetton has given an example about differences like if there's a uh what do you call road kill or wild animal dead by itself yeah. an anti natalist wouldn't have any problem eating that whereas vegan would have and i think these are superficial differences given the circumstances today yeah so the main differences aren't there <clears throat> as far as right to die is concerned i definitely agree to the concept of right to die uh, but again i think that there are many nuances to it and what scenarios who should be allowed to die blah 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 for example if you have children should you then have right to die without taking care of them etc so there are nuances to that but to a larger extent i definitely agree to the concept of right to die 
but I draw a very strong and hard distinction between antinatalism and right to die. Antinatalism is definitely against creation of new life. Whether we want to stop the existing life or not, it's a completely different subject, I think. Okay, thank you for that, Tejas. Um, I'd love to spend some time exploring a little bit in more detail about your animal rights uh, activism. Uh, you are, of course, an extremely passionate uh, animal rights activist on top of being an antinatalist. Um, I know we've talked a little bit about this already, but can you tell me a little bit about your history of involvement with animal rights activism. I know you're, you're always telling me, you know, on your weekends when you can, you're running around chasing dogs and I'd love to hear more about, about all the things you've done. Yeah, so over the years I've done a few things. I, I, so I became vegan in 2003 and I started thinking about it in 1995. But surprisingly enough from 2003 until about 2012, I didn't do any activism as such. It was just for me, my reading, you know, like, uh, and I regret that, that it was like, what was I doing? I was just doing my own thing. Um, but since 2012, I started going out and, you know, doing some sort of outreach or activism. Uh, I was in Ireland at that time. I used to live and work in Ireland. So I tried to do a little bit of activism over there against zoos, against, you know, for veganism and so on. Then I came back in India in 2019. So it's been almost two years now. And um, since I came back in India, really my activism activities have taken up. So almost every weekend until COVID happened, I was out there doing some sort of activity. It was either vegan outreach, animal rights outreach, or it was, uh, if it was, that wasn't the case, then it was about sterilizations of dogs and cats. Um, but almost every weekend I was doing that. And if not, then I was helping somebody translate something, some legal documents about animals. So yeah, that's the brief. Can I can I say something which I think should go on the podcast? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But I have seen in Bendham's older videos where he says that uh, catch and release is bad, uh, not just for wild, like for stray dogs and cats. Yeah, yeah. And that's you yeah. catch them, you sterilize them, you release them on streets. And then the next moment they can be killed by a vehicle. And this is very, very likely in a country like India. It actually happens. So it doesn't make sense to catch them, sterilize them, and then release them instead of euthanize them. Now I want to draw a distinction between killing and euthanizing them. If you are euthanizing a dog who does not have capability to know that he's going to be dead and then his uh, all other, uh, uh, what do you call uh, preferences are going to be deprived. He doesn't have a capability to know that. Then the, I don't know what the argument is against euthanizing those dogs or those animals. I can say that for humans, like if a human has preference, I'm going to do this after five years and I have want to do this and I would not be able to do that if I'm killed now. Or if I'm killed now, other people are going to be deprived of me. If that's the case, or even case of dogs, if there's a mother dog or whatever, then okay, I agree. But if there's a stray dog who is you catching for sterilization and you're going to release that dog again, there's nobody else who is harmed if that dog is euthanized. And if that dog is not harmed, if he or she is euthanized painlessly, then I don't see why we don't do that. The only reason I support sterilization of dogs is for very, very practical reasons. Yeah. The community we have got here of volunteers and non-governmental organizations and governmental organizations who support all these projects are coming from an emotional position that, oh, dogs, they suffer, sterilized, blah, blah, blah. And if I go out and say that euthanized them, no one's going to listen to me uh, and I would not be able to do what I'm able, able yeah. to do right now. At all. Yeah. So even though I agree with that position, I have to go practically and that's what I'm doing. Okay, so you, yeah. so, you're, you, you would think it would be more ethical to euthanize the stray dogs? Um, in certain circumstances, so if there is a dog who doesn't have puppies, if you know, there's no other, if we can prove that there is no other dog who has relationship to that, or you know, there are no dependencies on that dog, I don't find any reason why we should not euthanize that dog. Now, practically, I've never done that or supported that, but I'm I'm um, at a lack of answer to that, like. Why should we not? If that dog is at such a risk of getting hurt on the street so badly. Yeah. Okay. 
to me, it does go back to the fate worse than death kind of argument that I make. I mean, is it really more ethical to desexualize them, put them again in harm's way where nobody's taking care of them, they have to fend for themselves, or they end up in a cage, basically awaiting, an ad- at least in America, an adoption that never comes, lonely, yeah. you know, neglected, to be then euthanized later anyway because nobody's adopting them. Like, I'm all for adopting animals, like, if... But I don't... There's, like, this magical notion that every 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 animal that's in a shelter has like you know the perfect home to go to and i don't think that that's rational at all and i don't think it's more ethical to keep them alive just because it's and what's uh what's the distinction between doing that to stray dogs without relationships and humans without relationships what's the difference there yeah i can i answer that yeah of course go ahead of course i have uh, been asked this question uh, and again, what the position I'm saying is that I haven't come across um, yeah. euthanizing the dog. I haven't come across a, an argument against it, a logical one. And then what's the difference between doing that to a human? Let's say there is a human who doesn't, nobody knows that human. Nobody is going to be deprived by death of that human. And if we euthanize that human being, who is hurt? Are we causing suffering? Uh, one way is that that human had a preference. He had an idea about the future. He or she could plan for the future, which an animal, uh, well, they can do to a certain extent, but not as substantial as humans. Uh, that's one argument. But even then, once that person is dead, once we euthanize them painlessly, they are not deprived of that because they don't exist anymore. So what is the argument against it? And I'm, I have always maintained the position that I haven't come across a logical argument against it, is what I've said. Are you an Epicurean when it comes to death? Once you're dead, um, not the process of dying, I'm not talking about that. Once you're dead, I find I struggle with Benita's position that dead, death is still bad for the dead. Yeah, I, I haven't figured that out, at least for myself. Cool. I mean, not cool. I'm a deprivationist, but like, yeah, I, that's a, yeah, okay. Like, I, I don't, I don't want to go into like a whole conversation about the harms of death and, but uh, I don't, <laughs> thank you. Um, um, Tejas, what is it like to be an animal rights activist in India? Hmm. There, okay, one note, I always feel uncomfortable talking or generalizing anything about in India or of India because it's such an enormous and huge country that I don't even know a lot of things about India. But at the same time, my experience has been very good where I live, luckily, I have had company of very good animal rights activists. Um, the, it's it's a what do you call? It? It's a growing movement in India. Um, there are complications specific to India about animal rights activism, which are not probably found in some of the Western countries, uh, due to vegetarianism, due to the religious sentiments of people towards vegetarianism and non-vegetarianism and the politics resulting out of it and then the perspectives towards veganism off because of that so it's a bit of complicated subject um, but the movement is definitely growing it has been an excellent experience for me um, doing animal rights activism in india one of the things i want to also uh, note is that i have found luckily enough a big overlap like you know, I was probably the one, and I won't boast about it, but coincidentally, the one who introduced many concepts of antinatalism to many activists who I know over here, the animal rights activists. And I've had a very positive reaction, surprisingly, um, from most of them. I've Even the animal rights activists who are parents, who have children, who have grandparents, I've had, a, I know a, a grandmother who is now anti-natalist. Um, I introduced her to the subject. 
So I see a lot of acceptance among animal rights activists about antinatalism. Um, I see a little bit of, um, what do you call, not so much of an acceptance in the other direction. Like those who are antinatalists themselves, there's some sort of defense many a times about animal rights. So it's not bi-directional, but at least in the animal rights activism or the world in India, at least, they're very accepting of the idea of antinatalism. Okay, fascinating. Well, that, that does kind of uh, take us into my next question was, as you know, the antinatalist community and the vegan slash animal rights community um, is still very separated, though I think there have been some strides and connections, you know, that are slowly being made. Um, what do you think we can do to try to join the two movements together uh, closer? Because they are, they are almost like long lost twins in a strange uh, way. They feed into each other so... Uh, so seamlessly, you know, as far as uh, the, 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 the reasoning, um, but, but the people themselves are still very separated. Yeah. Yeah. So I think um, the animal rights activists themselves, because it's a growing movement compared to antinatalism, animal rights activism and vegan outreach are bigger movements. So those people are natural audience, like they are the easy audience for this concept. One thing I've seen is that in terms of in the anti um, animal rights activist world, in terms of activists, is that a lot of them are either coming from an emotional position, you know, uh, like have mercy, animal cruelty, etc., or coming from um, very uh, what do you call lifestyle position, like climate change and um, all those things. So. If we um, if we do, uh, I sort of try to do an antinatalism activism within animal rights activism sometimes. Um, and people do have accepting reactions. I've had a positive experience in that. So, okay, you are against suffering. You have an emotional reaction. But why are you that? And if you try to tell them logically, I've had young activists listen to those arguments and accepting that, if not calling themselves antinatalist right away, but at least accepting that. So that's one way to uh, join these two movements. Another is veganism has uh, definitely piggybacked on environmental and health um, concerns of, of veganism. And I think antinatalism can do that to an extent. Environmental concerns are definitely um, a side benefit of antinatalism. And we can um, you know, exaggerate that if we want. Um, in terms of health benefit, not so much, but maybe child-free movement has something to do with that, uh, you know, you have fulfilled life, et cetera, et cetera, if, you, if you're child free. So some sort of, uh, I would say, marketing tricks can be utilized from uh, what veganism has done. Okay, thank you for that. Yeah, I, I will say, I, I would love to, I hope to eventually see more antinatalist vegans like uh, doing activism, you know, to end factory farming. I mean, I think obviously that's, a given, but we're not really doing that yet in any kind of like real world activist kind of kind of way. I'd love to see more and more of that happen. What influenced you to be a vegan and how long have you been vegan? Okay, so uh, my initial roots of veganism had been in welfareist thought. Um, there's a politician called Menaka Gandhi here or Manika Gandhi, I don't. Um, she has been an um, active advocate against animal cruelty, although there is a criticism that she focuses more on dogs and cats than cattle. But she has been a motivation. It was a welfareist idea. I became, I started thinking about in 1995. I finally became vegan on 14th of February, 2003. And I remember that date, one, because it was Valentine's Day, and second, because I became vegan cold turkey. Not cold turkey as much because I was brought up as vegetarian anyway. Um, but I've been vegan since then. But since then, reading about the subject, Peter Singer, Tom Regan, um, all of that, then I sort of delved into animal rights, sort of agree with animal rights, and then speciesism, which is very strong anti-speciesist position I have now. Um, so that's the evolution of my okay. veganism. Thank you. Yeah, I actually think he said that all before. So like, I think you could cut that out. But okay, I'll go on to the next question. <laughs> Any tips for new vegans or people wanting to go vegan, Tejas? 
um i've had so i think the the most key part is to want to um i have spoken to people in different parts of the world like countries like pakistan for example people tell me that yeah i agree in principle veganism but it's just not practical i am a student i live in a hostel and it's not practical i can't get any and i understand that position uh for me what is important is to want to be to be in principle or to agree once you want to be a vegan everything else i think follows eventually um one tip if i have to if i can uh, say that i think we should not try to be a perfect vegan because we'll never be and uh, that doesn't mean that we should do anything and call ourselves vegan but just because something now i if i'm driving a car and the tires in my car are made of um, animal products that shouldn't um, that the, it doesn't follow from that that i then should eat animal products so let's not try to be a perfect vegan let's not let's not perfection be an obstacle to our progress so i'd say just want to quickly follow up on that like would that extend to like medications that have been experimented on or like uh, with animals or uh, have animal products in that um hmm i don't know i i do take medication which is which has been obviously tested on animals like uh, something like as simple as a paracetamol tablet which by the way i had to take when i had covid is tested on animals in all probability so i do take medicines uh, which are tested on animals so i uh, i'm sort of i don't know i i'll try to avoid as much as i can and there are vegans who would say that if you become vegan for health reason that would be a way to avoid that and you, that's why you should be i don't know to what extent we should stretch that for medicines i do take them personally i do okay thanks Okay, well, Tejas, I would love to start talking about your YouTube channel. Um, you began your YouTube channel on November 14th, 2015, and primarily produced YouTube videos on the subject of antinatalism in 2016. Um, I've told you this before, but you are one of my all-time favorite antinatalist YouTubers. The quality of your videos is always so impressive. You're so articulate, um, and, and you show such passion for antinatalism uh, and command of the subject. Um, I've watched all your videos again for this interview uh, and was shocked to see there's actually a very small catalog of material. I didn't really, I, I always, you know, imagine that you produce like dozens and dozens and dozens of videos, but it's really only a, a few, which is uh, amazing, you know, because I, I think they really have had quite an influence. Um, what made you start your, uh, your YouTube channel originally? Yeah, so I think 2014, 2015, 2013, was um, was a post argumentative era of antinatalism on YouTube, I think. Um, yes. Right. So one of the things I I had was that I started to get in. So as I said, I think since two thousand three or even earlier, I've been doing this for myself, and there was always an itch that you know, okay, I've been doing this, I've been validating my own thoughts, but should I not do something more meaningful than just uh, my own thing? Um, one of the things was to do videos on these subjects uh, and then outreach, of course. Now, vegan outreach and animal rights outreach had been pretty mature by that time. Like There have been many influencing vegans by then, vegan gains, and big vegan YouTubers were already there. And I thought I might not be able to do any value there because there's so much fantastic content out there anyway in that subject. But antinatalism was still a budding subject, even though it was this, the response videos have been done so many of them by that time. So that thought I had in mind, and this is something, an area I could do, and especially I can um, add a value to bring this subject from an Indian perspective and from a um, non-English perspective in different languages that I know of. That was a value that I thought I could do. And that was the reason I thought that I should start doing videos. Uh, in Mindums, again, videos again were making me to do to start making videos at the time. I was just watching his videos. The triggering point, I think, to do my first video, if I remember correctly, was that unnatural vegan lady. Yeah. 
who criticized and i and i think it was only my first thing to playing with that thing so it wasn't very good and i would want to do a response video again to her video at some point when i get time but that was a triggering point then always has to be a trigger for you to do something and then i started doing videos at that time i was in ireland fortunately i had a lot of time on my hands um, so i was able to do um, some videos uh, during that time uh, when i came back to india although i have been falling short of time almost all the time now so i'll start doing that at some point but who knows when not while you're a busy man. No, I'm glad you brought up, um, I think you were one of the first antinatalist YouTubers to produce regular content um, in a language other than English. I mean, I'm sure there were, there were some, I mean, before that here and there, um, but not really that had, I can't think of anybody else that really had like an antinatalist YouTube channel. Like the channel had an identity as a, as a, as an antinatalist channel. Um, so I think you were, you were definitely one of the first. Um, had you ever made videos before your antinatalist channel? Had you ever made like vegan videos or, or anything like that? No, I hadn't made, I was watching a lot of videos, but I never made uh, videos on veganism or antinatalism, um, veganism or animal rights. And, you know, as I said, I thought that the movement was mature enough and people were doing great stuff than what I could think I could add value to in that subject. Uh, what kind of reactions have your videos received over the years? Most of them, uh, well, this is sort of, um, I run a risk of being in an echo chamber there because uh, most of them are accepting comments. Uh, some of them are uh, trolls or maybe good oppositions also. Um, but most of them are accepting, but I don't know what to make out of it because there is all probability that if you agree with the subject is you would come to see my video. So that might not be a good indicator of what the reaction be. Okay, interesting. Um, I just want to comment about some individual videos. So you made a video um, at one point called Re uh, Antinatalism Short-Sighted, which was a response video to somebody uh, at the time that at the time was calling themselves English Jackass. Um, and this person had a lot of channels over over time went by many names. Uh, what for the longest period of time was called Flange B at one point. But anyway, he was he was very representative of a kind of phenomenon in the antinatal world at the time where people would make uh, videos very, very passionate about uh, antinatalism, uh, vehemently, no pun intended, for it. Um, and then the next minute be a hundred, uh, you know, would do a complete 180, be a, completely against it, be very anti-antinatalist, and then um, do this over and over again, rinse and repeat into antinatalism, out of antinatalism, into antinatalism, out of antinatalism. It's not something you see very much of anymore. It may be kind of an artifact, like a strange psychological artifact fact of the medium itself of like putting oneself out there in the video medium talking about these things um but i was just kind of w wondering what you thought about that phenomenon because you are from that time where that was sort of a a hallmark of, of youtube antinatalism why do you think that that happened uh, so much at that time um hmm, i can construct a theory to make myself satisfied that's all i can do because i don't have evidence-based answer to that but i think a lot of people who make youtube videos especially about antinatalism come from a psychological position many other times like they are having mental problems depression and they think so it's you know uh, sort of the uh, the idea of antinatalism appeals to them for that period and then they, when they actually get out of that problem and they um, are stable they think, oh, hang on, this was just some depression, and then they go back. Might be what might be happening. And I think um, we've had some people like that, like who are in the spells of depression, come and make video about antinatalism, and then go back. Uh, even in in, Engli in case of the person called English Jack Ash, Jack Ass, uh, this happened to him, I think, if I don't, um, I don't remember correctly, but I think this happened. So that might be the reason. Why doesn't ha it happen anymore? I don't know. Maybe it does. Uh, don't know yet. But that's that might have been the reason at the time. I think. 
Okay, interesting. Yeah, thank you for your thoughts on that. Um, your response videos were just the absolute best, uh, particularly your response to plant-based hippie, who was another one that a lot of people made responses to at the time. I made a response to her. Um, and also Stefan Molyneux, which was uh, just a, an insane video that he made. And your response was, I, I think, definitely the best one that, that, that came out of that. Um, what can you tell me about these videos, the reaction to them, and, and uh, what do you think about the quality of their arguments? Um, the first lady plant-based hippie, whatever she was talking about, <clears throat> that's, I think, a common common mistake uh, people who have children would do. Like, they would confuse creating children to raising children. Uh, we are against creating them, not raising them properly. So that triggered me make, to make those that video. And I think she has taken that channel down probably now so it's unfortunate that i think so that person's uh, videos are not there uh, because i think those should be there i mean even those which criticize antinism should be should not be cancelled out is what i think um so that mistake was like very obvious mistake to to be pointed out and that's why i made that video um although i don't you know like that wasn't a very intellectual video i mean her video itself didn't have any stronger arguments. So I don't know why that video has gotten so many views compared to the others, whatever small number it has. Um, but it isn't very intellectually appealing, actually. But, you know, melodrama appeals to social media, I guess. So that was one. The Stephen Molyneux, though, I mean, Stephen Molyneux, like the whole content of Stephen Molyneux should be responded in many different ways and i don't think his channel should have been taken down i don't think his twitter should have been cancelled i don't even think donald trump's twitter should have been cancelled but that's a different subject but so i i have responded only to that one particular video because he's directly talking about antinatalism and he's directly raising fallacies about antinatalism so i responded to that but i would have responded to many other videos where he talks indirectly about antinatalism. For example, he, he's talked a lot about why white women should marry and have children. It's enormous number of videos. And we should have responded to all of them. Those videos, by the way, must still be there on BitChute, I think it's called.com. So if you want, we can respond. So in my, like, I would want to respond to every one of his video, to be honest, but I just don't have time. Wow. So I did only even that one. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I would. Oh, I would. I would certainly love to see you respond to all of his videos. Uh, I did want to say. I, I think that one of the th reasons why that plant-based hippie video, and I think she later called herself American Unicorn, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I think the reason why that video was so powerful, or upset so many people was you know she made it with her with her kid right there like there was such like an obvious disconnect from the feelings of the child directly like she's literally sitting there complaining about how her life sucks because she made the decision to have the child and the child is literally getting upset you know knowing something kind of negative about themselves is being said and um that's kind of a that's kind of a screwed up thing to put on the internet, and so I, I I think that may have one. And on top of that, you responded to it very well, so I think that may be part of why it had such. A I I, um, I I had a doubt in my mind that you know the clips I've used from her video, I didn't care if those clips had children in them when I put them in in my video. Yeah. And I had doubt whether I is that an ethical thing to do? Should maybe I shouldn't select the clips where children are there, but I thought. Uh, so it can be argued that that's an unethical thing. But I did that on purpose because she included her children in it. Um, one thing, though, I don't consider that as a groundbreaking melodrama because it's a very common thing for mothers to complain about having children in front of their children, as far as I have seen. True, true. It's not uncommon. Really. So It's a contradiction, but it's not uncommon. Right. Most of them don't talk about antinatalism while their kid is present. But yeah, I understand what you're saying completely. Um, you also made two response videos to something called the Noble Wolf podcast, which, you know, I'd have to go back through the whole history of podcasts, but I think was one of the first instances of like a podcast making an episode about the subject of antinatalism that wasn't like an interview with David Benatar. It was like, it was really one of the first of like two people get on a 
you know, with microphones and talk about the subject. Um, I think it's defunct now, the podcast itself, um, but they actually did make a video response to you, which I know was a long time ago and it's a fairly obscure, you know, response video to, to you and to an antinatalist. Um, and I know you had some plan on responding to them and I don't blame you that you didn't, but can, can I ask you sort of what you thought about their arguments and, and, uh, and what you thought about their response to you in that exchange? Yeah, it's been a long time, so I might be slipping a few things here. Um, as far as I remember, the main basis of their arguments was coming from some sort of appeal to ancestry or ancestors, right? Because our ancestors have done this, it had a arguably racial tint to it. Um, but, um, yes. you know, ignoring that even then, they were saying that because of our ancestors have done so much and had they not done that, this would not have happened. So we should continue this. And that was like very um, obviously false argument, which um, I had to respond. In, in terms of making a response to their response, I thought it was a practical thing. Like how long was this going to go and yeah. how much value I'm going to add to that was all the considerations for not making that anymore. I can go back and look at that and make another response anyway. Yeah, maybe I'll do at some point, hopefully, maybe when I retire. But um, but yeah, that's why I didn't make it. It was all practical reasons, like you know, what value I am going to do after that. Yeah, I understand that completely. Do you have any plans for the future of your channel? I well, I don't. Uh, so this answer is similar to how to bring about extinction. Um, I want to. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I believe I will at some point. Right now, the work is so busy that it's not allowing me to. But I definitely and passionately want to make more videos on the channel. I think you'll get your chance to. I have no doubt. Um, I want to talk a little bit about your What Antinatalism Is Not series. Um, you did a series on your channel featuring videos in both Marathi and English called What, is, what Antinatalism Is Not. It was a, a series of, I think, seven or eight videos, if I'm not mistaken, uh, but which I wish would get more attention. And I actually kind of wish more people would do things like this. Um, can you tell me a little bit about why you made this series? What inspired you to make this series of short videos? There's, um, for any new thought, whether it is veganism, animal rights, or antinatalism, or anything else, there's always um, two, uh, two mechanisms of stereotyping these new movements of thoughts. One is you stereotype them unknowingly uh, by misinterpretation. And another is you stereotype them knowingly because you're against it. And people who do it knowingly take advantage of people who are doing it unknowingly. Um, same thing is happening with antinatalism, no difference there. So there are certain stereotypes and there are certain, I believe, misunderstandings about what antinatalism is or is not. Um, and I thought it is important, it was important to point out some serious things like it's not a death cult, we're not for killing people here, blah, 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 which um, needs to be addressed. And I think needs to be addressed even more. Uh, that was the motivation behind doing that. Okay, thank you for that. Um, do, can you think of anything you would like to add to this series now or ways to expand it further? Yeah. I I don't know what all I have covered there. Uh, if I've covered whether it covers all species or not. Um, no, I don't believe I need so. to go back and see what. Yeah, so then that's another thing, very important thing that it's anti-natalism. It's not anti-human natalism or whatever. Um, then I, I don't know if I've done it, whether it's against marriage or not. Uh, especially, I know I've done it's it's not against sex, but whether it's against marriage or not, that is something another. Uh, this is yeah. because now again, I'm, I'm coming from a local Indian context here. A large majority of people in India, and I would talk for Indian subcontinent really, would equate marriage, sex, and having children. Like, yeah. you know, most prob most people would not have given thought to differentiate these things. So if you're against one thing, they would obviously assume that you're against other things um, as it is. So the, to differentiate these things and to tell that antinatalism is not against or for these things 
but against only these things is important uh, from the outreach point of view. So some of those things I think uh, still need to be made. Uh, both Mark and I just wanted to make a quick note that we both think that your asymmetry video is probably the best on YouTube. Um, you know, there's tricks and then there's yours. There's like a couple of other people that have really good ones, but it's yours is just so good. I don't know if you want to say anything extra about that, Mark, but. Yeah, I just like the, the way that you explained it. Um, you used a lot of um, the concepts that Benatar used in a more uh, natural language that I think. Uh, like lay people can understand and um it was uh yeah you got a lot of information in a short amount of time and it was very clear and articulate and yeah i just want to say kudos to that yeah okay. well, and you did it in you. two languages thank you for that glad to know yeah, yeah. link below I to that i wanted to do that in in hindi also but uh sometime we'll see but but thanks for that, definitely. Glad to know. Um, okay, so uh, now I think we'd love to talk a little bit about Child Free India. So you are, are, of course, a member of Child Free India. How did you first get involved with the Child Free India project? Um, when Child Free India started, um, I was not in India. So I was remotely being involved with Child Free India. So it was started with, I think, Anugraha and Pratima, who are also part of our a &I. Um, just but their idea was that let's at least first normalize not having children it's a big taboo right now in india if you don't have children especially for women they have a tough time not having children many women are like close to ostracized um, if you don't have children so the idea was let's make that i think our life goal just be should be to normalize not having children we'll see about the later things later um, that's where I think it started, but uh, they wanted to um, include all hues of child freedom at that time. So whether you're anti-natalist, whether you're child-free, even childless to an extent, if you want. Um, so include all non-procreative thoughts and people in that. That was the idea. And to do an outreach in India. Um, not many people know about antinatalism. Child free, is, child freedom is gaining some move, you know, like moment now, momentum now, because of environment and population and COVID and blah blah blah. Uh, antinatalism, not that much yet, but I think that's a step towards that. So that was a motivation, I think. Yeah, I, I, it was such a revolutionary move to uh, like A&I, &I, I mean, Child Free India was the first to do this, to combine all schools of anti-procreative thought. I mean, Anugra was telling me in his interview that something like 20% are vehement. There's only a few affilists, but I mean, just to include everybody at all, to try to find that unity is, is just astounding. It's something that inspired me tremendously. Um, for, for sure. Um, had you known Pratima and Anugra a long time before all this started? No, not before Child Free India movement. So it's through Child Free India where I came to know. So even though they are uh, from India and in India, we live worlds apart. Like we live in a diff live in different states, right. like about, I don't know how many miles it is, but like 500, 600 kilometers. So maybe 400 miles. Um, and different cultures, different language. We can't communicate in any other language than English. So, right. you know, yeah. so I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Um, you are the, uh, the founder or the head, I'm not sure what, what exactly the right, correct word to use is, of the Pune division uh, of CFI. Uh, what kind of things have you done with Child Free India specifically in Pune so far? Obviously, I know this last year, not much has been possible, but before that, what are the things you've done? And so we have um, sort of a group of people who at least are child free, if not antinatalist, not all of them, um, who want to do something about it. A lot of them, surprisingly or unsurprisingly, come from the activism background about veganism and animal rights. Um, and these people are now sort of getting um, or understanding the importance of outreach in this area as well. So they have ideas about how to do outreach. They know how to go and speak to people on streets. They know the challenges. And this concept is new to them. So there's this group. Um, we also did a small meetup once, like an in-person meetup um, in Pune about people who agree with this. 
uh, some people came along uh, thought thinking that this is something to do with child welfare and they didn't agree with it so that was also there so that meetup happened then i also did some attempt of, of doing street outreach on this subject uh, we had two events i think um, one in a young uh, one in a college where we meet a lot of young people and another one in where people go and uh, you know go to relax so my intention is to start doing street outreaches similar to what we've done for animal rights um, obviously right now since last year we can't do that so hopefully this goes down and we'll be able to do it yeah i very much hope that can happen that sounds exciting um child free india was of course the origin of the uh, enormous rafael samuel phenomenon in 2019 can you give me your thoughts on everything that happened in regards to rafael samuel's rise to international anti-natalist fame and uh, the influence that he's that he's had it was very good i mean all thanks to rafael whatever he is doing um i'm at that time i wasn't in india but i was following up what what's happening there so that i think was uh, like to get on bbc and to get on uh, what's his name stephen colbert and all these shows it was amazing and the again it's not like very deep in terms of philosophy and you know all, all those things we are interested in but it's a fact that when we have to get out and go to the people um, if i may use the word masses um we have to tone the message down very much we have to water it down so that it's palatable um at the same time it has to be some sort of a stunt so that it is appealing yeah. and i think rafael was successfully able to do both of those things and that's why he got uh, what he got um i i hope it continues i i know it there's always you know uh, ups and downs in the flow but I hope it continues. It happens more and more, more and more to more people and not just Rafael. But I'm all supportive of, you know, what happened to him. Yeah, absolutely. It was, again, incredibly inspiring to watch all that happen. Um, what do you hope to do through Child Free India in the future? Like, what are your, you've talked a little bit about your goals, but I mean, if you had a, you know, a, a big goal, perhaps a way of combining what you're doing with Child Free India and Antinatalism International, you know, what would you most like to see happen? Yeah, so you refer to Child Free Pune. So Pune is the name of a city in India. Um, what I would want to do, or my vision would be to start these chapters across at least the cities first, because it's the urban population who is more sort of, um, I know I'm generalizing, I'm not, I know I'm stereotyping also, but uh, there's a more probability of, getting acceptance to these ideas than in the urban regions than in the rural regions first so at least in the cities cities like mumbai like delhi like pune like bangalore we would want to have stronger chapters going on stronger events meetups activities outreach events um, zoom events maybe going on in these cities first um, and then get these into media and then get as many cities as possible at least at least to get the child free message there's always going to be an anti natalist undercurrent there uh, but that's the immediate thing i think uh, and when i say immediate considering the situation immediate is in terms of next i don't know how many years uh, maybe a decade but at least that much is what we want to do Amazing. I, I, ho I hope that all that can happen. Um, all right. Now, I'd like to ask a couple of questions uh, about our organization, our group, uh, Antinatalism International. So I think, Mark, you have the first question. Yeah. How did you get involved with the ANI project, Tejas? I think um, there were attempts to form such a group in the past. I think we did, did Facebook groups. We thought like, okay, how can we do an international group? And I was uh, luckily, fortunately enough to be involved on those groups as well. So I think I was, uh, I think I was then also invited for this podcast initiative at some point. Uh, I'm sorry, I could contribute much to that. And then um, it followed from there that, okay, let's form a proper organization. And then I was invited to that. So I think 
I, I'm just fortunate to be part of that. What have you enjoyed most uh, about working with ANI so far? What have what have been the big, biggest challenges um, that you've encountered thus far building ANI? The biggest challenge was to agree on a logo. <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, so I, I think there are one thing is that um, ANI group is. I think the people we've got in ANI are really people who have got sound heads on their shoulders. Really. There's no, you know, there's no, there's a good understanding. We, I think we work as a group, really work as a team, not in sense of any cliches. Um, and we have, we have people who wouldn't have uh, knee jerk reactions to things who can think. And I'm, I'm really, um, uh, what do you call jealous of some of the youngsters we've got like at such a young age they can articulate arguments so nicely and in such a sound manner um i'm definitely very appreciative of that yeah i agree i agree we have some very impressive uh you know i i wish i had been so it's articulate uh at, at that age yeah sorry mark go ahead uh what are your hopes and goals with a and i so i've i see parallels between Child Free India and ANI. So in Child Free India, as I said, what I would want to see first is to have a child free chapter in every city um, or in most leading cities. Um, similarly, for ANI, I think it would be really nice to have antenate list chapters going on in as many countries as possible um, and then within cities as possible. So that would be the first goal, I think. And there, you know, there are some goals like we should um, have resources and then distribute the resources. All these would be an aid of achieving that goal of having an outreach, having a reach all over the world in different countries. And I think we're doing good in, in some terms, like we've had people from Japan uh, starting to work on that, people from some European countries, um, um, I've had people from talking to me from, from Pakistan also, like, you know, like all over the world. It's not just uh, industrially developed countries or this countries or that countries. There's no pattern to it. Either. Yeah, I also hope to help that can happen. I think that the the vision of, of uh, chapters is going to be very, very important for us. Um, the Animal database is, of course, one of our biggest initiatives. What is the Annie, the Animal database? Uh, what can you tell us about this project and um, the plans for it to be built? So the grand vision of that is we want to build a single uh, source of truth or a single point of contact um, where people anywhere in the world can look up for services um, either for of abortion or euthanasia or maybe arguably rescue of animals. So if you are somewhere in Sri Lanka and you have an animal who you think needs an abortion or needs to be helped, euthanized or what, in whichever capacity, you should be easily able to go and look up at single place where filtered down by the country, filtered down by the place, look at what services are available in that location. That's the grand vision to build a database like that, which will help people all around the world. Uh, that's what we want to do. Who, uh, but at, at the same time, we are careful about not including the services which help breeding, for example, cattle or breeding dogs or anything like that. Because there's, there's a huge chunk of veterinarians who have been involved in that also. So people who can provide some sort of um, I don't know the word, but some sort of service to reduce suffering of animals, especially abortion, euthanasia, and rescue. You want to build a database for that. What do your friends, family, and coworkers think about your um, beliefs with antinatalism and veganism? How do they yeah, react to that? I compare that to someone who is um, homosexual 200 years ago. So I... I I mean, like I'm in a closet, you know, like I don't go, uh, I don't tell about my antinatalism at work, for example. Nobody at work knows my antinatalist thought. Um, I do a work, I am responsible, I manage work of about 30 odd people. Most of them are parents, um, if not wanting to be parents. 
um, I congratulate people on having children. I have to. Um, so that way I am a closeted antinatalist. I don't go at work and say that um, these are my antinatalist thoughts. To an extent that is also about veganism. I only tell about veganism at work when you know I have to go to these parties or gatherings and I say that I don't want to have something if at all somebody really asks i have to tell so at work nobody knows about these concepts i also maintain two different phone numbers for that reason um in in, in case of family and immediate family my immediate family knows about my thoughts um i'm open on these about on facebook again i have been successful enough to be isolated on facebook from my work colleagues and that's also one of the reasons i have my name in non-english script because you can't search me easily uh, so a lot of my family and friends are on facebook and they now know about these things these thoughts people don't talk to me about it i don't know for what reason i would be very happy to talk about it but they don't generally come out to talk about it so oh, it's yeah. like a yeah. elephant yeah they don't uh, one of the reasons is that you know as i said i come from a very orthodox background and people don't if you are if you have these thoughts they would just have a small talk with you like how's the weather how are you feeling blah 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 they won't go into deeper discussions about it because it and i would i think for myself i satisfy myself with thinking that maybe they don't talk about it because it makes them uncomfortable i don't know um but my immediate family my parents definitely know about this um my some of my brothers like my brother and cousins know about this I've had this discussion with some real friends, like uh, a few cousins of mine who are my good friends. I've had discussions about this. But apart from that, uh, the rest of the family, they don't know. Uh, so uh, even the outreach, vegan outreach, which I do, I usually go further from where I live. And I do that because uh, my parents are sort of not comfortable uh, with the idea of having a revolutionary in their home. Uh, really so i don't want them to be in a socially awkward position so i do go out further from where i live and do these outreaches is there any other hobbies that you have other than like antinatalism and veganism which i don't know if you would call that a hobby but like um yeah on your spare time do you have do you pursue any other um things yeah right now um so i'll answer in two Right now, I would be lucky if I get some spare time, but uh, I do like I used to follow. Um, I don't know if you know this game called cricket. I used to play a lot of cricket at some time, and it is in contradiction again because a lot of equipment and the ball itself is made out of leather. Um, so it's a contradiction. Uh, I used to do that. Over the time, I have seen my um, hobbies to say or passions change at some at one point i was like until i think until 2012 2013 i was very passionate about um, science and physics um i have seen like deeper lectures of people like uh, leonard suskind if you know who who would be who'd give lectures really technically deep lectures about physics um i used to do that that was my sort of hobby um, but over the time, I have gone away from that, realizing that that's not the ultimate answer to meaning of life in any way or form. But my appeal to that was that, that I used to think that if you crack down what the space time is and what physics is and what how things are and what this universe is, that's the quest to find meaning of life. But I've realized that that's just a way to measure things. So I've gone away from that. And now I've started getting into philosophy more. Um, so I sort of try to read, um, I like reading more about philosophy. And these days I read more papers than books and because of time really. So papers like intersectionality between um, animals and, uh, and uh, other issues like animal rights and feminism, animal rights and casteism, and animal rights and religion and so on. Uh, sort of has become a hobby. I follow a few people on that. And I read their papers, um, their research papers. So, so I don't know. It's a, it's not a appealing hobby, to be honest. It's, I don't know if it's a hobby. It's a boring thing for for some people. I do. Is there any other topics or books that you like to read? I want to um, like like to read as in 
I would want to read. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of Benetar to read yet. Um, I still have to read a lot on evolution. Like there's a lot of material apart from Richard Dawkins. I don't think I haven't read much. So there's a lot to read there. I think which I want to. Um, what I'm, I think I lack is reading on antinatalism apart from Benetar. And that's like people like uh, Julio Cabrera, people like um, uh, Chiron, like Emil Chiron, you pronounce, if I yeah. say, say it right. Uh, so there are people in antinatalism who have written books and I haven't read a lot of them. So that's something I want to read. I've read a lot of Schopenhauer. So that's covered, I think, but uh, not these people. So that's something I, that remains. Okay. Do you have any thoughts on the subject of pro-mortalism and how it relates or does not relate to antinatalism? How would you define the term? Okay, so that follows from the last question. I still have to read, uh, how do you pronounce it? Juan, who, what was his name? Juan, uh, you know the person who wrote a book on pro-mortalism and then oh, Juan. died? Juan. Juan. Juan Hurang. So that is one book in my list which I have to read. So I haven't properly studied that subject. That's the first confession. Um, Pro-mortalism, as far as I understand, is different than antinatalism. We are in opposition to creation of new life. We are not necessarily supporting ending of existing life, uh, but at the same time, right to die and all that, we are supporting. So we are not definitely killing for new life. Um, at least under normal circumstances. So as far as I understand, we, I'm not a pro mortalist. Out of curiosity, have you read um, Christopher Belshaw's refutation of David Benatar? We, we, we interviewed him, and actually the interview with him is coming out tomorrow. So I was just, just curious if you've read that paper. Yeah, so I, so this was the, the first time I was introduced to that was on Mark's uh, study stream, I think. And he oh, cool. went to that <laughs> paper. Uh, yeah, so that's uh, obviously I haven't read. I want to read that paper. So I'll try and download it from SciHub that now Mark even has given the link. Do you have any thoughts on the subject of transhumanism and how it relates or does not relate to antinatalism? Yeah, so I have um, gone through David Pierce, this is your podcast with David Pierce, I think. Um, I like a lot of David Pierce's ideas. I have to say they are appealing. But I haven't studied as much, I should also say. So there are many different ways to achieve transhumanism, I think. And uh, I'm not qualified to talk on pros and cons of those ways. But one thing I want to say is that the, if the ultimate goal of transhumanism is to create beings who can never suffer, who are going to be in this state of pleasure all the time, who have zero suffering, if that is going to be the end goal, I think David Benatar has said in one of his interviews, and I think it's it's with either Peterson or Sam Harris, Sam Harris, that if we have these beings, let's imagine that there are hundred such beings who can not suffer at all, who are just feeling pleasure. And I thought he said then we should be indifferent to it. Uh, there isn't much of a difference between them not existing and them existing without suffering. So far, and I'm open to change on this, I think the real value comes from suffering. Most of uh, the pleasures which we enjoy are only pleasurable when we are actually deprived of them. I say most because there, there are always surprisable pleasures, but they are very ephemeral. Most of the pleasures, so if I, I want to enjoy eating ice cream, I only enjoy it when I am actually craving for the ice cream. So the real part is I'm always alleviating some sort of suffering. Um, and maybe it was the first time when I was not expecting the ice, the taste of ice cream that I enjoyed it. I was only first time, but later when I have the craving only then can I actually enjoy that ice cream. So in that respect, if we think that all pleasures or most pleasures, not all, are most of the times alleviating some suffering, then if we have this transhumanist goal where we have some beings who can only enjoy, who are only having pleasure and no suffering, I agree with Benetar that we should, though we should be indifferent. There isn't much difference between the two states of the non-existing and existing with these. 
pleasurable states. That much uh, so far I know. It was a very interesting answer. I'm not sure I have to think about that a little bit. Um, what are your views on overpopulation in relation to antinatalism? You made a comment in one of your videos that I, I, I loved. I thought it was just very, very interesting um, that even if there are two of us on planet Earth, we're overpopulated. Um, can you explain that a little bit? Also just your general uh, view? Yeah. I think that came, if I did that comment, I don't remember when, but if I did, um, that has come from, again, I'm sorry if I'm making too much of Beretta mm -hmm. here, but he has said that in somewhere in his books. Uh, so somewhere it must have stuck in the back of my mind. And I agree with it that if there are even two people or two beings who can reproduce, two sentient beings, we are overpopulated. Uh, but that's like a sort of a dramatic way to put in. The regular overpopulation, which, you know, which is thought like are humans overpopulated or are, are other, any other species which is overpopulated. In that respect, I think there is a lot of overlap to the concepts of or concerns of overpopulation to antinatalism, especially living in India, I experienced this firsthand. Um, so because there is an overlap, we should exploit that overlap. And what I, what I mean is that when I go out on the streets or when I talk to people about this, I see that it is more appealing or palatable to people when I talk in terms of overpopulation than I talk in terms of asymmetry or risk argument or don't have any children at all. If I talk about overpopulation, uh, there is more chance that people are uh, getting appealed by that. That's my personal experience talking to people about it. So that's an overlap we should be exploiting, I think. What do you think of the antinatalist community as it exists today? That's a very hard question. Um, what do I think? I I think, and again, this is something maybe I am making myself happy here. Antinatalist community is a diverse community. There are a lot of disagreements. There are a lot of uh, fights, even I'd say. And there are a lot of good things also coming out of it. Uh, why I think it is a good thing is um, it's an indicator of a growing movement. Uh, there is a precedence to this. Vegan community, animal rights community, is nowhere united um, and it's not united from the start if you read the literature that went on in 1944 uh, when donald watson and some other people were trying to establish the vegan community the reason altogether they started vegan society was that they were banned by vegetarian society um, they said that vegetarian we would not accommodate you Vegetarian society said that we would not even give you a, a lane in our shop. We would not give even give you a, a chapter in our magazine. So that's how it started. And even at that era, I've read some literature, what happened, what the letters were of Donald Watson and others. There were enormous discussions and debates and disagreements. And that continues today, um, till date. So I see that as an indicator of a growing movement. Maybe it's a uh, feel good factor that I'm just uh, victim to. Uh, maybe it's not true. We need evidence for that. But uh, that's what I'm thinking right now. So it's a good thing that there are fighting, there's fighting going on, but because there are more people into it, there are diverse points of view. I know Julio Cabrera I don't, doesn't agree with Beneta. He has his strong position. I, I heard your, I saw, or maybe I read your podcast, I should say. Um, so, and that's okay. I think we should have all diverse backgrounds coming in this. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. And I mean, my hope is that, you know, we've been sort of a little bit too segmented for too long and the different ideas have been, you know, gone in their corner and these ideas have gone in their corner. And I think with A&I and, and with Child Free India, there's been a real attempt to kind of put everybody in the same room and... <laughs> Everybody is kind of kicking and screaming to get out of the room. Um, but I, I, I do think that that's an important step in the right direction. And, and uh, so I, I'm, I'm, I, think I, I think I agree with you far more than I disagree with you. But how does that work when you have like opposing views on things? Okay. If you have diagonals, like um, what do you call diametrically opposing view. For example, I cannot work with Stephen Molyneux on I don't believe anything, really. Um, so that obviously is not going to work. But if you have overlaps, for example, 
somebody is child free and not anti natalist or somebody is um, against overpopulation believes that at least india is overpopulated let's talk about india for example and is in india and is with me here and they are they agree that we are too populated here and we need to do something about it and i think that we it's not just that india is overpopulated we are overpopulated that's okay but the over the overlap is overpopulation so if we concentrate on making the overlaps work i think we can work together and i worked with anti um, animal rights activists like that as well i worked with some environmentalists now i don't agree with a lot of environmentalism um, i i'm not denying climate change but uh, there are a lot of things to be debated there so but at the same time i worked with them to do outreaches so if we exploit again those overlaps i think we can work together okay i just have one final question uh tej is what do you think anti natalists are doing right so far and what do you think we're doing wrong what we are doing what anti natalist community is doing right is anti natalism i think there is <laughs> there is no debate well there is debate but you know anti natalism is the right concept i i believe what what are we doing wrong we doing a lot of things wrong we haven't really figured out how to take this message down um to the level which will appeal to people in general i mean we can't it is not practical to expect everybody to read david benedetto and understand it's not easy i'm not claiming i understand everything of it so um it's unfair to expect everybody to understand those deeper concepts in philosophy so we haven't figured out how to take that message down to the levels where people can easily uh, take on board we haven't obviously figured out how to answer the questions about what mark raised like you know you are talking about you are advocating something about which you yourself don't know how to achieve that something is going to be there so i'm not saying it's wrong maybe it's a gap we need to always keep on working on um, those are the two things especially the message of outreach we really need to do some work on that i think I don't have an answer how, but that's definitely a gap I see. Run in a second, but okay. Atay, just I just want to say, you know, I just want to tell you what a pleasure it's been to work with you this last year, uh, developing A and I. You really always have been a, a, an inspiration to me, and you've challenged me in a lot of really interesting ways over the years. Um, and I just want to thank you for that. And yeah, I'm just really excited to try to continue uh, to do what we're doing with A and I and I'm excited to see where child free india goes and uh yeah I I hope that we can do everything that you're saying you know developing uh that kind of out those outreach tools that we're lacking right now answering those questions and um finding the correct path so yeah absolutely thank you so much thank for being for our guest words, yeah absolutely Tejas. thank, thank you, you for having me thank you yeah thank you so much for being our guest today on exploring antinatalism if you'd like to learn more about Tejas, you can follow him on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. Links below. Thank you for listening to the Exploring Antinatalism podcast. This has been Amanda Oldfan Sukunik and Mark J. Maharaj. You can find us on YouTube on the channels Forever Wolf Film and Question Mark, respectively. Keep up with my daily antinatalist news updates at Antinatal News on Twitter. Please follow the podcast on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and email us at exploringantinatalism at gmail.com. The podcast can be listened to on the YouTube channel Exploring Antinatalism Podcast, as well as Buzzsprout, Apple Podcasts, and Stitcher. Our website, www.exploringantinatalism.com, was designed by the amazing Visions Noirs. Please visit Visions Noirs at www.bionoir.com and find more links to more of his work below. Logo art by the incredible Life Sucks. Please visit his YouTube channel. And if you would like to perhaps purchase one of the new Exploring Antinatalism t-shirts by Life Sucks, please visit his Etsy page, www.etsy.com slash shop slash Life Sucks Publishing. And proudly announcing our new theme music has been graciously provided by I Doubt It. I Doubt It is an alum of the Exploring Antinatalism podcast, so please listen to his episode, episode four, and visit his amazing YouTube channel. All the best, and bye for now.